Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. Joining us for this segment, we have Seth Wander, Chief Financial Officer and Chief Investment Officer of Acorns, Alexa Von Tobel, Founder and Managing Partner of Inspired Capital, and Josh Crawford, Vice President of Training and Development at Matson Money. National Financial Literacy Month is recognized each year in April to raise public awareness of the importance of financial literacy and maintaining smart money management habits. Our panel joins us today to discuss the key to building wealth and the benefits of lifelong financial planning. It's great to have all of you with us. Welcome to Trade Talks. And let's go around the horn here quickly. Uh, we'll start with you first, Seth. Give us some background in terms of where Acorns fits within the financial planning ecosystem. Yeah, and Jill, thanks for having me. Uh, Acorns is a uh, saving and investing platform that has helped millions of Americans really plan for their financial future, first starting with really small transactions like roundups uh, and now servicing uh, uh, the full range of, of opportunities for people to invest in the long term. Uh, we've had over $20 billion of total capital invested through Acorns. And then in addition to Acorns, where we serve adults and families, uh, we also have our GoHenry brand in the U.S., which helps kids uh, really enter the financial ecosystem, learn how to start to save and invest for their future as well. Uh, and happy to partake in the discussion today. All right. You got it, Seth. And Alexa, tell us about Inspired Capital. Certainly a great name. Thank you. Um, I run a venture fund, but called Inspired Capital. We're a generalist fund here in New York City. But in addition to that, I'm a certified financial planner, New York Times bestselling author, and just published my third book called Money Matters with Rebel Girls um, that came out two weeks ago and is selling extremely well and is literally here to pay the next generation forward in terms of playing offense with their money. So i um, very happy to be here today. And Financial Literacy Month is a very important one. All right. And we're happy to have you with us. And of course, Josh, tell us about Matt's and Money. Uh, Matt's and Money is a company that really focuses on training and developing investors in the science of investing. Uh, so one of the things that we're uh, into at the moment is we have a two-day course. We've brought thousands of people through the course uh, in which people discover academic principles uh, as well as a purpose for the money. Um, so we're really big on education, training, and development. And we currently manage right around $10.5 billion in assets. All right, and Seth, let's talk about the importance of financial education, particularly when it comes to educating kids. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so for kids, I mean, I've got three kids myself, uh, you know, teenagers down to uh, a nine-year-old. And one of the things you you learn as a parent and, and you see is you know, kids who grew up with really good habits usually continue those on as adults, right? I mean, if they're well-mannered kids and they're taught the right things, they usually become well-mannered adults. Uh, and that is true for the financial ecosystem and the financial principles as well. You know, learning the value of a dollar proverbially, but but certainly understanding what it means to save money, how to spend smartly, what a budget looks and feels like, how do we make trade-offs with things we, we can afford and can't afford or need to plan for in the future. And, and, and so we've worked really hard at that at Acorns and particularly at, at GoHenry, uh, we've got tasks and allowances built into the app. Uh, parents get to sit down and teach their kids. If you, you know, if you do this, you can earn some money. And then how do you budget for things? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, we all know there's only a few things you can do with money. You can, you can spend it, uh, you can save it, you can invest it, and you can give it. And if those four things are the primary things you can do, then learning how to uh, bucket and plan and budget appropriately from a young age is a great way to start adulthood. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're squarely focused on that. Right. And of course, it allows them to make informed decisions when it comes to financial well-being. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, is we try to embed education into everything that we do. Uh, so, you know, whether there's videos on, on, you know, how to even balance a bank account, for example. I mean, things that um, give people the tools so they understand why they're making the, 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 the decisions that they're making is fundamental to to making a right choice, but also understanding what the alternative choices are. Uh, and so we do the same thing at Acorns. We, we embed that education throughout the flow. Uh, and, and we know that that resonates well with, with our customers. Right. And Alexa, how big is the financial illiteracy issue? I mean, it's an incredibly problematic issue. Um, as somebody who spent, you know, the last 20 years of my career, I built LearnVest, sold it to Northwash Mutual, et cetera. Um, we were helping people in their 20s and 30s and 40s play defense with their money, help them get out of credit card debt, help them fix their credit scores. And the sad thing about our financial infrastructure here in the United States is it's 
very, very damning. Meaning if you make a big mistake, it's very hard to get out of it. It takes a long time to pay off credit card debt, a long time to fix your credit score. We still, over the last 15 years, are not teaching financial literacy in elementary schools, high schools, colleges, grad schools across the country. Yet this is a topic that every human being on this planet has to deal with every single day of their life. So it's wild, candidly. And I think the, the way we like to think about it, and especially this new book, Money Matters, that I just wrote, um, is playing offense. We have got to go ahead, touch kids when they're in their second, third, fourth, fifth grade. If you can do second grade math, you can actually manage your wallet. It's really, the math is, the math piece is not complicated. And so um, I wrote this book to go ahead and play offense and try to get into the hands of kids across the country, every single place that a kid can be, you can get the book um, because we need to fix this financial literacy issue. It's profound. Great. Yeah, I mean, off that, yeah, I was going to say off that point, you know, one of the things that we see in schools is that, um, you know, kids these days, a lot of them still put their money, like, you know, proverbially under their mattress, but, but certainly in their desk drawer, or they have a little wallet at home you know, they really haven't um, adopt, ad adopted the tools that they have available to them to start to think about like long-term planning and how to use their money appropriately. And what's surprising about that is that we go to the schools and we see that when we talk to the kids and yet the schools themselves don't have the curriculum to serve them appropriately. You know, they talk about, uh, let's say businesses and how to think about uh, running a business, which is great in its own right. But the personal finance side is, is what's really key. And um, I, I'm sure Alexa's book is amazing. Uh, there's another book out there called uh, Psychology of Money. And, and what it really teaches you is that, you know, money is very personal for each person. And sometimes parents are uncomfortable having that conversation with their kids because it has such an emotional undertone to it. And, and so the earlier you can give those, cool, give those kids the right tools, address the topic uh, and have that conversation, the better off the kids will be in their future. Right. Josh, I'm curious to get your thoughts here because you were in the realm of financial education when it comes to adults, right? So are you seeing some of these challenges translate or, or are you, um, is there really a lack of knowledge when it comes to preparing and, and you know, thinking about finances? Uh, totally. I think this is one of the biggest issues that absolutely needs to be addressed. Uh, when we're training and developing adults, the most common thing we hear from people that go through the training is I wish someone would have told me this 20 years ago. So I, I agree with the other guests on the show. I think financial literacy is key, but then there's also educating kids on what prudent investing is. I think one of the issues uh, kids are facing is investing is now being gamified. So it's nearly impossible to distinguish the difference between speculating and gambling with your money on an app, uh, no different than sports betting and how to prepare for your future. And investing is one of these areas where preparing for your future is critical because if you make one mistake in this area, it can, no kidding, wipe out a lifetime worth of wealth creation. And I just think education is key and it's a way to protect investors and protect adults and children from potentially making that one mistake. Right, Josh, and I think that's an excellent point you bring up. I mean, it's even beyond financial planning. Think about Amazon, you just point and click and it's available, right? Yeah. I certainly know when I was younger, you know, I work all summer and babysit or I worked at Foot Locker <laughs> or wherever I was in the mall and actually, you know, getting the paycheck or getting cash and seeing it accumulate as I saved it in, you know, my my drawer, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's a big difference. And um, I can see it with my own kids that point and click mentality to your point gamification not seeing it physically, I, I think, you know, while technology and progress and it's great and Amazon use at my house every day, I, I just feel like, you know, the gamification of it and the accessibility, almost perhaps too much accessibility, if that makes any sense. T totally. Sure. Well, totally. Especially with like, you got apps like Robinhood where, you know, on, you could go on there and you're stock picking, you're trying to predict which stocks are going to outperform the market. You pick a stock and confetti falls on the screen and you know, it's all fun and games until it's not. Uh, so, what we have found is when people understand markets and they understand uh, how markets work through education, uh, they're not tempted to make those kind of costly mistakes. Right. And Alexa, and I see in your notes here, teach delayed gratification. So I want to talk to you and Seth about this. How do you tactically teach kids at an early age so that they can understand and it isn't simply just gamifying the process? Sure. So there's this amazing study out of the University of Michigan that just came out in the last year, which shows that the tone used in a household by parents in front of kids as young as three, four, five, truly changes how that child will interact with their money 
as when they are a grown adult. So if the tone is matter of fact, positive, upbeat, even if you don't have that much money, but it's matter of fact, positive, upbeat, your child is going to engage and interact with money in positive ways. If the tone is super toxic, very, very stressful, your child creates these negative associations and delays impacting money. You asked about delayed gratification. That is simply what money is. It is about saying, I'm going to think about retirement savings. I'm going to save today so I can spend tomorrow. And building those habits with little kids really, really early is incredibly powerful because you make it second nature, just like learning to brush your teeth. You feel guilty if you don't do it. You know you need to. And so every time your child gets a paycheck of any kind, do keep it physical to your point on the digital. Everything is magical money these days, Apple Pay, Amazon boxes, make it physical, make them every time they get money, put some away in their piggy banks, physically make them do it every single time. And all you're doing is building this muscle in them that they will continue to allow exists as they get older. And then I totally agree with Seth, which is as they get a little older, when they're 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, make them a digital account. Let them see their statements. Let them see the numbers. Let them learn through osmosis, compounding interest, the power of investing. As an investor who manages an almost billion-dollar fund in venture investing, let people see it. Let them watch it grow. It makes it infectious and something that they will want to engage with for the rest of their life. Right. And Seth, if you could follow up there in terms of tactically teaching kids, because at the end of the day, it's it's almost like when it comes to dieting, it's not a one-time thing. You need to make it a mindset and create healthy lifestyles. I mean, well, we all, all know that the uh, the tortoise beats the hare, right? So you have to use lessons, whether they be literary lessons or real life lessons to help kids understand this stuff. And I think Alexis, right, is the tone has to work through the parent, right? You know, they're not going to fully self-educate by themselves, but having a good uh, a mentor, a good principal, a good uh, a good mom or dad to teach them those things, I think is fundamental to it. You know, one of the things that we see is that kids do identify with brands. Uh, and so in the in the immediate, immediate world and the formal world we live in, you know, stocks can get acquitted to brands. You can still teach diversified investing and yet also own brands, all right? And so you have to find that like, that thread between what still um, uh, satiates their need to have that affinity for the thing that they know really well, but also being able to do it in a uh, diversified portfolio that's set up for the long term. And so at Acorns, when we have our earlier account, which allows parents to invest in kids' future, you know, mostly for education, but could be for any other uh, you know, uh, need as they turn into adulthood, uh, the money is there for the long term. So, so implicitly they're investing for the long term. Then it's how do you educate within that? So, so they understand when they own the S and P 500, what are the different companies within that, that they also have a piece of. Right. And of course, Josh, you go into adulthood, this translates into staying invested. Oh, totally. Uh, one, one point, one point before I get into that, just, I, I think speaks to what both the other guests were saying. Um, what we have found. So in our course, we actually distinguish something called the no talk rule. So there's this whole pervasive no talk rule in our culture where it's like off limits to talk about money. And I do think that's at the heart of the problem uh, for why so many people have financial issues. And what we found is if you do train the parents, they take it to the children. So uh, training the adults is a great way to get the ch children involved because a lot of these parents, their parents never talked about money. And if they did talk about money, it was a terrible time in the house. So if you can take away some of the significance that uh, adults have around money, it opens up this space for them to communicate powerfully uh, with their children. So I think that's key, educating adults on uh, how to have productive conversations about money that they can foster in their uh, household. Now, uh, yeah, when it comes to investing, you've got to be invested long term. And the reason is no one knows which way the market's going to go. Uh, the market's perfectly random and unpredictable. The next 10 to 20 percent, no one knows. Historically, we do know the next 100 percent is up. Uh, so you have to be invested in equities. Uh, you have to be globally diversified and you've got to be in it for the long term. Right. Alexa, one of the things that we cover here during Financial Literacy Month and, of course, throughout the year is making financial literacy and education accessible to everyone, including the underserved. Do you think there's lack of financial literacy curriculum in the American education system because it's not a one size fits all solution. Many, many families, one person might be the first to go to college or there is no generational wealth or you know, the, the language, the vocabulary just isn't there. It's not like it's a black box kind of thing that you could put kids in front of. No, I mean, as a certified financial planner and a selling author, I can say that the education is the same. 
the, the most beautiful thing about money is it's math. It works all the time. And it doesn't matter if you have very little or very big amounts of money. It's the same math, just different scale. So it should be in every single school, every single elementary school. And in fact, the fact that 15 years later, after I started building LearnVest, on this same sort of mission-oriented financial literacy should be there for the American wallet, it's still preposterous that it's not there yet. And coming out of COVID, where more and more people, you know, more than 80% of the country lives paycheck to paycheck, which means families feel very unstable financially, which is clearly the bedrock of our society. If a family feels unstable, that's not a good thing for, for our country. Um, and the fact that it's still not taught in schools is, is, is problematic and we need to fix it. Again, I decided to write a book because... I didn't see it being fixed anywhere else. Money matters. You can find anywhere that a book is sold uh, with with Rebel Girls. But no, it's not, there's no excuse for why it's not taught in schools. Go ahead, Seth. Yeah, I mean, one of the cool things that, that we've been able to do to help fill that void is uh, you know, we acquired Go Henry, which was originally a, a UK brand, uh, and they have a nice presence here in the US. But they've won uh, an enormous number of awards in the UK for their financial literacy programs. Uh, they're called Money Missions, and they're built into the app. Uh, and what you're seeing now is actually that the British Parliament is looking for the tech industry, Go Henry, and others to participate in helping build that curriculum so that the schools can catch up from where they're at. Uh, I would imagine that, you know, the partnership with the schools, both elementary schools, as well as through uh, secondary schools in the U.S., will be something that you know, will follow as you start to see other governments push that agenda. Uh, and it, it's great for us in the sense that, like, kids get highly engaged with it. You know, they enjoy it. They're short bite type videos. Uh, and the more that we can all do that, obviously, the better we serve the community. Yeah, and it seems, you know, it's so interesting that we're able to provide STEM classes, right, which are certainly more technical, but in terms of basic budgeting, it's it, it just seems like a natural fit even before. I mean, it's almost like you need to understand these things before you can leapfrog and, and learn about different STEM disciplines in my mind. Yeah, I mean, the funny thing about that is, you know, uh, you could go back when you know, a few of us here graduated college and there were different industries that were really big. I mean, for a while, people, everyone wanted to be an investment banker. They wanted to be a consultant. They wanted to be an attorney. You know, I am sure that the the fundamentals of, of STEM will be, you know, here for a while. But there are evolving trends that happen in that. You know, what is not evolving is the fundamental need to understand, you know, how to how to budget appropriately, how to live below uh, lower than your means and how to invest for the future. You know, that's a, a different need than than um, some of the education that happens outside of the school related to STEM, let's say. All right, Josh, final thoughts here. Yeah, I think that uh, this whole topic of financial education is key. Uh, and when it comes to investing, it has to be the right kind of education. So one of the things I absolutely can't stand is there's something that they, they, they used to play. I'm not sure if they still play in schools called the stock picking game. <laughs> so essentially, they're training these kids to speculate and gamble with their money. They might as well train them in blackjack. Uh, so I, I think what we could do at a, at a high level is train kids in modern portfolio theory, uh, train kids in efficient market hypothesis train kids in uh, thinking for the long term and not getting caught up in the hype of the moment. Uh, and I think if we establish those mindsets at an early age, we'd see a dramatic shift in how the next generation deals with money. All right, we appreciate everyone's insight. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Market Reporter at NASDAQ.